The other day I saw an amazing picture. I happened to be in at a local airport when, and this is a true story now, as I was looking at some airplanes, a bird flew by me at about eye level. A bird flew by me, and behind it was its nest. It was literally carrying its nest. This was a full-grown, mature bird flying by me carrying its nest. I reached out by instinct. I didn't grab the bird. I grabbed its nest. The moment I grabbed the nest, the bird collapsed in exhaustion. I looked at that bird while holding its nest, took it in my hands, and I began, it took me about 10 minutes as I began to cut away that nest. All of the wrappings, there were fishing line, there, there were all kinds of things, thread wrapped around the bird's foot. In fact, the bird's foot was actually crippled from that leg being bound up by its nest. It didn't need its nest anymore. It was a full-grown bird. But it was flying by and moving onward, carrying its past. It was carrying the things of its upbringing. It was carrying the burden of what was. That bird didn't know me. I didn't know the bird. But I began to unravel the burden off that bird's leg. Now imagine this for a moment. Play along with me. As I loose the nest of the bird's past from its foot and turned it loose, the bird flew away. It flew higher than what I'd seen it fly before. In fact, it flew up and landed on the top of a building. What was that bird thinking? What was it feeling? It was liberated from its burden. It had power like it never knew before. And it had gone higher than it had ever known in its life. Why? The burden was released. Jesus said for us to not worry, to cast, as it were, all of our care upon him because he cares for us. My friend, I want you to think about that. Maybe in your life you are burdened like that little bird, but keep this in mind. Your burden is not forever. Someone in this bird's life stepped in from the outside. I stepped in from the outside and cut that bird loose. Jesus wants to step into your life and cut your burden loose that you might experience a glorious new life. In fact, it's our hope that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life. That's a true story. I was at Chino Airport and this bird flew right by me. I watched it go by. I couldn't believe it. I reached out and I grabbed the nest and it just collapsed. And I wound up setting it free from its nest. I want to be your teacher. I want to help change your life. I'm Dr. Ed Heinsohn. Dr. Ed Heinsohn, one of the world's most honored, educated, and beloved Bible teachers, is bringing his knowledge, his wisdom, and his amazing gift of teaching to you. Come with me on an exciting journey through the Bible that will change not only you as a person, but perhaps God will use you to change the course of history. Most of us are familiar with a red-letter edition of the Bible where they highlight the words of Jesus in red. And yet many times the same people that did that forgot the last words of Jesus are not in the Gospels. The last words are actually in the book of the Revelation. Uh, we're also familiar with the seven last words of Christ from the cross. Uh, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, or uh, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Uh, I thirst, uh, it is finished, etc. But the last words of Jesus are actually recorded in the last book of the Bible, in the book of the Revelation, where Jesus appears to John on the island of Patmos and commissions him to write the book of the Revelation. If you have your Bible, take it today and turn to Revelation chapter 1, and we want to take a look at what are the real last words of Jesus. We begin uh, with the opening statement in the book itself. It says in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is the revelation of Himself. Yes, Bible prophecy is all about what is going to happen in the future, but more than anything else, it's all about who is coming in the future. It's all about 
him. Uh, it's the revealing of his character and of his commission uh, and of his concern. And we're going to look at all of that today as we examine some of the last words of Jesus from the book of Revelation. And in the weeks to come, we'll take a look at all of those things that Jesus had to say in the final revealing of himself to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The term revelation means to unveil, uh, the word apocalypse, to reveal. So hence the revealing of the person of Christ, of the message of Christ, and ultimately of the plan of Christ. Uh, the prophetic message of the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It also begins by emphasizing the character of Christ, where he is referred to as the Alpha and the Omega. Those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Since the Bible was originally written in Greek, uh, that should not surprise us then. Uh, it would be like saying in English, I am the A and the Z. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. It's ultimately all about me. Take your Bible and look at chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, who is, present tense, which was, past tense, and which is to come, future tense, the Almighty. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is, He was, and He always will be. God did not have a beginning. God has always existed from eternity past. The world had a beginning at the moment of creation when God spoke the world into existence. The material world then begins to age because it had a beginning and it will one day have an ending. God does not have a beginning or an ending. He always has been. He always will be. He is. He was. And He always will be. And then He says in verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what you see right in a book. So much of Revelation then is a vision of what John saw. He's writing as fast as he can under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to record the vision. So there are times he tries to actually uh, explain the unexplainable, tries to describe the indescribable. Things fly by, he's not sure what they are. He describes them in the language of the first century as best he can because he's literally seeing the future before it occurs. Now, before we get into those details, we want to focus again on the character of Christ himself, the Alpha and the Omega, uh, the beginning and the ending. Uh, he is called in John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, in the beginning was the Word, uh, the Logos, uh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, the writer of the Gospel of John wants us to understand Jesus is not just a great man or a good teacher. Jesus is God. He is divine. John 1 declares that right from the very beginning. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You have the same idea in the Old Testament prophets. In Isaiah 7, 14, the prophecy about the virgin birth. Uh, he says, the virgin will conceive and bear a child and call his name Emmanuel. Now, Jesus was never literally called Emmanuel. It's a title. It means God with us. He literally fulfills that. When God is incarnate in the birth of Christ, God steps into human flesh. God becomes a man. God is a divine being who looks like a human being. Jesus is fully human, and yet he's fully God. 100% human, 100% God. Uh, it's what theologians call the hypostatic union of the divine and human natures of Christ. You say, well, how do we know that Jesus is the eternal one? Uh, Micah in the Old Testament, chapter 5, verse 2. The prophecy about the fact that the king that would be born in the future would be born in Bethlehem. And he says of the ruler that will be born in Bethlehem, his goings forth are from everlasting, from eternity past. He has always existed. He is the eternal one. He's the one who was born of a virgin in a virginal conception so that he is born as a human being without sin, so that he as the sinless son of God can go to the cross and die for our sins. He's the first 
and yet He's also the last. He's the beginning of the revelation of God's love and grace and truth, and He's the end, the final revelation of God's love and grace and truth. The revelation is the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. It begins in His first words in the book, revealing the nature and character of the one who is the revelator. We'll come back in a moment and see what the command to write was really all about. Today, we have a special offer from the King is Coming telecast. Dr. Heinsohn's End Times Video Library, a collection of 15 DVD series in two attractive storage binders, includes topics like angels and demons in the last days, final signs, global warning, the battle for Israel, Jerusalem in prophecy, the coming Middle East crisis, Armageddon, End Times Wars, plus seven more. With a total of 50 powerful messages, this is an amazing offer. Normally, we ask $20 for each DVD. That would be a total of $300. So for your gift of just $100 to help us take the message of Jesus around the world, you'll save a startling $200. Why, that's two-thirds off. Make your gift of $100 or more payable to The King is Coming, Box 907, Colton, California, 92324. To use your credit card, call 800-622-2767 or go to thekingiscoming.com. After revealing his own character as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, then Jesus gave the command to John to write the vision and send it to the seven churches. Uh, look at verse 11 in your Bible. Revelation 1, the 11th verse. He said, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches that are in Asia, literally in Asia Minor, in western Turkey. Seven literal churches that all existed back in the first century. And then he lists them and names them. Uh, Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira, etc., all connected by the same Roman highway in ancient times. He is speaking to the churches as Lord of the church. The command to write reminds us God is not some impersonal force in the universe uh, who is difficult to know and understand. No, he is a God who reveals himself to us. Uh, theologians call that uh, the revelation of God in general in the universe, in creation. But the writing of the Word of God is the specific revelation of God where He has revealed Himself literally by speaking to men of God that were prophets of God and apostles of God who would convey the message of God to the world in which you and I live. In other words, God loves us so much, He didn't say, I'm going to create the world and I'm just going to let it go and hope you can all do the best you can and maybe someday you'll figure out who I am. No, the universe tells us as we look at nature that there is a divine being, there is a God, there is a designer behind the design of the universe, uh, there is a creator behind the creation, but looking at the world alone physically does not necessarily tell you that that creator loves you or that he sent his son to the cross to die for your sins. You need the Bible to understand that, uh, the revelation of the word of God in print. Uh, that's why, interestingly, Jesus is called, in John's Gospel, the Word. Uh, in fact, later in the book of Revelation, in the 19th chapter, when Christ appears in the triumphal return, uh, the rider on the white horse is called the Word of God. He's the personal Word, as God has revealed Himself in the person and character of Jesus, and then He gives us the written Word in the command, write these things down and give the message to the seven churches. Then John tells us, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, uh, like a Jewish menorah. Uh, and then suddenly someone in the midst of the candlesticks that appeared to be the Son of Man. Uh, it's the depiction of Christ Himself. He appears as the high priest of heaven in the long robe with the golden sash, but He's moving among the candlesticks that symbolize the seven churches. He's Lord of the church. Here is Jesus, a Lord of heaven, Lord of the church, the high priest of heaven. He has ascended into the heavens. He's at the right hand of the Father. He serves as our advocate in heaven. He serves as our great high 
high priest in heaven. Again, the book of Revelation is not only about what's going to happen in the future, it's all about him. It is a revelation of the nature and character of Christ, of his concern for our lives as he commands John, write down the vision of the revelation. John says, when I saw him, in verse 17, I fell at his feet as though I were dead. Think of that for a moment. You don't just casually walk into heaven one day and say, Ah, here I am. Where's Jesus? John was Jesus' disciple, the one that leaned on his shoulder at the Last Supper. He was the only disciple that showed up at the cross. There was not a disciple that had a closer, more intimate relationship with Jesus. And yet John says, When I saw him, 60 years after his death and resurrection and ascension, when I saw him in all of his glory and power and majesty as the risen Savior, I fell at his feet as though I were dead. But then this tender touch. He laid his right hand upon my shoulder and said, Fear not. God wants to remind us that we don't need to be afraid of the message of Bible prophecy. Prophecy is not written to scare us. It's written to prepare us. It's not written to frighten us. It's written to invite us, come to Christ while there's hope, while there's time. Now, notice what he says to him. Uh, he says, fear not, I am the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, same idea. Uh, I am he that is alive, present tense, and was dead, past tense, and I am alive forevermore, future tense. Amen, and I have the keys of hell and death. Wow, what a statement. Jesus is clearly claiming to be divine. He is not just a good human being who was a nice teacher, who said some nice things, who gave us a, a better understanding of how to love people and get along with people. He did all of that. No, he is the sinless son of God who went to the cross, died for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, is alive today at the right hand of the Father, and who appeared to John on the island of Patmos in about the year 95 A.D., the last revelation of the last words of Jesus were given, not in Jerusalem, not in Bethlehem, not in Galilee. He gave the final revelation of his last words on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea in Gentile territory to remind us that he had gone to the cross to die for the sins of the whole world. Uh, not just for the Jewish people. For them, yes, but also for all non-Jews, for all Gentiles. He is the one who is alive. He was dead. He's alive now, and he's alive forevermore, and he has the keys of hell and death. He alone can unlock the grave and bring people back to life one day because he alone rose from the dead never to die again. To have the keys of death and hell uh, fulfills then what he said to Peter when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He gives to you and me as his disciples, his followers, his believers, he gives us the keys of the gospel as we preach the message of truth from the word of God. The message of the gospel goes forth like a key to unlock the door of death and bring people into an experience of spiritual life life in a relationship with God himself. Hallelujah. What a wonderful Savior. That's not all he's done, and that's not all he said. We'll come back in a moment, and we'll look at some more of the final words of Jesus. Oh 
Notice again what the first chapter of the book of Revelation is all about. First of all, you see the character of the person of Christ. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Then you see his command to John the disciple, who at that point was the last living disciple left on the planet. Uh, John is now an old man. Jesus appears to him and commissions him, write the Revelation, write the book, uh, write what you have seen in the vision. And then thirdly, we see the concern of Christ. When John falls before him and cannot move, Jesus touches him with the nail-scarred hand and says to him, John, fear not. It's me, Jesus. You're not alone and abandoned here on the island of Patmos. I have come for you, John. I've got a job for you to do. Stand up. Get out a parchment. Get out a pen. We're going to write a book that will change the course of history. Notice how it's expressed in verse uh, 18 of that chapter, when the Lord says to him, uh, I am he that is alive, was dead, am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and hell. And then verse 19, write the things that you have seen in the past, the things which are in the present, and that which shall be hereafter in the future. Uh, you have all these triplets that run through that chapter. Uh, the Lord appears to John, commissions him to do the writing, uh, and then he says to him, uh, I was and I am and I always will be. And John, I want you to write that which was and is and will be in the future. Now, most of Revelation is a picture of the future, that of prophecy of what's going to happen at the time of the end. But John was also talking about what had already happened when the Lord appeared to him to commission him to write the book. Then he sends the letters to the seven churches, those that existed then in the present tense in the first century. And then the rest of the book from chapter 4 on is a revelation of what will come in the future. So he says, I heard the message. I heard the command and the mystery of the seven stars, Jesus tells him, uh, that are in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks is this. The seven stars represent the seven angels of the churches, the covenant angels that watch over the churches, and the seven candlesticks, which you saw, are the seven churches. Now that tells us that much of Revelation, obviously, is a symbolic message. But these are not symbols of unreality, they're symbols of reality. The symbols are intended to help you understand the nature of the book, uh, that God sees the church like candlesticks that are the light of the world. Remember, Jesus said to the disciples, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. And all of that imagery comes through in the book of Revelation. Now, we've studied it often in detail as we've looked at the prophecies. But in these next few weeks, what I want to focus on is the person of Christ himself and what Jesus said in his last words. If his last words from the cross are significant, uh, it is finished, paid in full. Uh, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, etc. If those are significant words in the life and ministry of Christ, then the words that he said after the resurrection are also just as important as what he said from the cross. Oh, there were a lot of words when he appeared to the disciples and said, Don't be afraid, it's really me. Touch me and see that I'm real. Thomas, be not faithless. Put your finger in the nail print and realize it's really me. No, Jesus appears literally to the disciples uh, after the resurrection to show himself alive, Luke says, by many infallible proofs for 40 days. Uh, Jesus wants them to be convinced, I'm really alive. What transformed those fearful disciples who forsook him and fled and denied him? What changed them into the most courageous men that have ever lived, all of whom died for their faith in Christ? The reality of the resurrection. They had seen the risen Savior. And John sees him again on the island of Patmos, and he realizes the character and nature of Christ. He and he alone is the beginning 
And He's the end. He's the beginning of the firstborn of the creation of God. He is the one who is the ultimate revelation of the truth of God. It's Jesus alone who can change your life for time and for eternity. You see, the message of the Bible is not written just to intrigue us about future events. It's written to draw us into a relationship with a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Either you know Him for sure as your Savior, and you're certain you're on your way to heaven, or you don't know Him at all. You don't have to die confused. You don't have to die one day lost. You can know for sure that your sins are forgiven, that you're on your way to heaven, that you have the gift of everlasting life because you've put your faith and trust in the one who was and is and always will be. You raise me up to more than I can be. The book of Revelation actually ends with an invitation, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Uh, he that heareth, let him come. Uh, he that is athirst, let him come. God has made every provision to meet the deepest spiritual needs of your life. He wants to have a personal relationship with you, and He wants to extend His grace to you by allowing you and me the opportunity to put our faith and trust in what His Son did for us on the cross when Jesus died for our sins and when He rose again. You know, when Jesus uh, encountered people uh, in His earthly ministry, He would simply say, Come, follow me. And they would abandon everything and go and follow Him. Perhaps today's the day that you need to do that. Uh, you need to stop looking at all the options. You've looked at them all your life. And finally come to the realization there's only one who's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's time for me to put my faith and my trust in Him. If God's tugging at your heart about that today, I want to urge you right now, shut everything else out for a moment. Get alone with God. Call on Him. The Bible says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But you've got to call. Call by faith. Ask Him to save you. Ask Him to change you. And if you're praying that today, and if you're asking the Lord to do that for you, and you want to fully understand that commitment, write to me or go online. Let me know of the decision you're making. Hundreds have already done this in the last few weeks. I want to send you this booklet, Jesus Saves, for free. It'll explain to you how to know you're saved, how to know you're on your way to heaven, and how to grow in your walk with Christ.